welcome everybody to our event on Slovenia 30 years after independence, still the region's front runner, question mark, on the occasion of Slovenia's, uh, I would say, 30th birthday next week. Um, everybody who has passed this threshold knows when turning 30, there is some serious ground for stock taking at this age. So seeing what has worked so far, where's room for improvement or change needed and how should the future look like? Slovenia was in the past often regarded on the happy side of life, well known for its gradual approach to post-communist reform with only limited privatization and also high levels of economic development. Just to quote a few baseline indicators on the Human Development Index, Slovenia is on the 22nd place in 2019 between South Korea and Japan. It is the second most equal European country by income. Indicators connected to health, education, environment, safety, and other areas of well-being generally paint a very positive picture. So self-assessments of life satisfaction put Slovenia on par with the EU average for 2018. And if you look at democracy scores, according to Freedom House, it is that of a consolidated democracy. So one should think that this is already makes this already makes a pretty good stock taking for 30 years of independence, leaving us all happy and probably even envious with Slovenia. However, there's also uh, the other Slovenia, which was presented in international media during the last 12 months. And these are painting often a very different picture from what some of these indicators say. So some even threaten that the country might currently or in the near future um, face democratic backsliding like Hungary or Poland have in recent years. So this is just a brief setting the scene uh, and to point out that we can expect a very interesting discussion this afternoon for which we have invited five internationally renowned experts from Slovenia on Slovenia to take stock of 30 years of development in independent Slovenia and discuss about the present and the future. So I will introduce them in alphabetical order. Uh, I'm glad that Matej Aubel is with us today. He's a professor of European law at the new university in Ljubljana, uh, where he is also the rector. He graduated from the University of Ljubljana Law Faculty. He holds an LLM from New York University School of Law and has a PhD from the European University Institute in Florence. He's an expert in the fields of EU law, constitutional law and legal theory. And accordingly, he will tell us today something about the question, constitutional backsliding in Slovenia. Next, I would like to welcome Nico Korpa, who is an economist at the Institute for International Economic Studies in Vienna. And there he's the country expert for Slovenia, researching uh, apart from Slovenia, the green transformation in Central Eastern Europe and the Western Balkans, also uh, green schemes like green taxes and international trade in relation to the environment. Previously, he worked in the circular economy in Slovenia and helped write a national circular economy roadmap for the country and also for Serbia and Montenegro. And today he will give us a hint on economic developments and prospects in Slovenia. So very much looking forward on this. Um, then I would like to welcome Alenka Krasovets and Meta Novak, who will act here as a duo today. Alenka is professor of political science at the Faculty of Social Sciences, uh, University of Ljubljana, and researcher at the Center of Political Science Research at the same institution. Her research interests are political institutions and processes. And Meta is an assistant professor at the Faculty of Social Sciences at the Uni of Ljubljana and researcher at the Center of Political Science Research. She holds a PhD in sociology. And both will contribute today on the question, Slovenia, uh, is it a consolidated democracy? Last but not least, we will also have a view from, uh, from practice. And I'm glad that Spela Stare is with us today. She has been Secretary General of the Slovene Association of Journalists since 2002. She graduated in journalism and started her career as a journalist on the famous radio student and has become over the years an expert in the field of media legislation. She plays a crucial role now in operating the Journalists' Ethics Council, where she participates in the development of code of ethics of Slovene journalists and also drafts ethical recommendations and guidelines. And she will accordingly uh, tell us today something about media freedom under attack in the country. So um, 
we will proceed as follows. Uh, each of the panelists will now have exactly 10 minutes uh, to make their points and give us a brief presentation about their uh, specific topic. Uh, I will then kickstart a discussion. And in the meantime, both during the presentations, but also during the first round of discussions, you as the audience will have the time to put your questions and uh, to, to formulate your questions in the Q&A section. Uh, and I will bring them then in for the second round of questions to our panelists. Uh, just a quick remark, it would be great if you would keep the questions ideally brief and probably also add to which of the panelists the question is added so I can easily pick them up. So um, without further ado, I would like to start uh, the presentations and Nico will be the first one uh, to present us his view about uh, 30 years of economic development in Slovenia. Nico, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. I'll just share my screen. Can you see the slides? Very well. So yes, uh, thank you for inviting me. First of all, Christian, um, to this occasion, I will um, share some thoughts on the econ economic development of Slovenia and at the end also um, the future outlook. Now, obviously assessing a country's economic development of 30 years in, in 10 minutes, it's not possible. So um, I suggest we focus on this uh, basic question. Is Slovenia still the region's front runner in economic and socioeconomic terms, of course? And um, we will look at this question from different angles and, and thereby also go very quickly for the past, touch upon the current situation with the coronavirus and uh, finish with a brief outlook um, to the future. So without further ado, is Slovenia still the region's front runner? As Christian explained earlier, yes, it is. To that claim, I would add two caveats. So first of all, if you look at uh, GDP per capita, apart from the Czech Republic, Slovenia leads in this uh, category. Also, if one looks at salaries, the Human Development Index was already mentioned, and so on. Today, the GDP of Slovenia reaches about 90% of the EU's average. The first caveat is, of course, uh, that this uh, primacy of Slovenia compared to other transition economies uh, and the EU member states which joined after 2004, so this gap is actually uh, um, shortening, has been shortening since um, the economic crisis in 2010. Um, and some reasons why this has happened, um, I, will I will tell you with the help of this graph, which I prepared, which shows uh, simply the GDP in proportion to the average uh, EU GDP adjusted for prices. So I think this is a nice proxy to discuss um, and compare the economic development. And on these lines, you have Slovenia, you have all of the new EU member states um, under CEE 11. So this includes Croatia and Bulgaria, Romania, Baltic countries, Visegrad countries, and all the, the rest uh, of the Yugoslavian uh, countries. And if we start at the left-hand side in the 90s, you will of course notice the vast uh, uh, difference in the starting points. In 1990, Slovenian GDP per capita was 60% higher than that of CEE 11 countries. In the year 2000, it was 80% higher. And we see this um, kind of uh, trend of steady growth and, and a persistent gap uh, um, compared to other C, um, new EU member states, basically um, being persistent until about 2007. Uh, after that, the economic crisis starts. Um, I won't go too deeply into what are the reasons uh, that the economic crisis hit Slovenia worse than it did the other transition economies. As you see, the Visegrad, Visegrad countries grew steadily in this time, where Slovenia basically lost a decade in terms of GDP, which only rec recovered um, by about 2018, 2019. Now, some of the reasons why this has happened in Slovenia include uh, a very problematic situation in the banking sector, macroeconomic mis mismanagement in, in, in times of the crisis, uh, a legacy of, of, of bad loans given to companies, often through corrupt practices just before the crisis uh, happened, a collapse in foreign demand, which is very difficult for the 
uh, open economy that is the economy of Slovenia. And what has happened then was uh, a pe pretty long period of stagnation and growth only picked up um, after about 2014. And afterwards, Slovenia grew still above the EU average, but as you can see, other uh, new member states have been uh, gaining ground compared to Slovenia. The reasons for that, again, are complex and we don't have time to go into them. I would suggest some of them are um, low rates of investments, not only private investments, but only government, public investments, which were stifled by the fiscal rules, which prescribed um, a balanced budget in the medium term. Uh, in part, this is also because of a long and heavy economic restructuring. A lot of privatization happened in this time, and the economy of Slovenia is now arguably more akin to that of other CEE uh, countries, so more reliant on exports, more welcoming to foreign direct investment, um, more with, with less state ownership, um, and so on. And another big reason is um, something that I think will be discussed throughout this event is the kind of a collective inability to make big and important choices to invest in infrastructure to engage in a second uh, large developmental project after the first one which was really to enter the uh, EU and to adopt the euro and that this brings us um, to the current situation basically the, to the last year and the coronavirus um, very simply put, from a health perspective, the first wave was well managed, the second one wasn't. In economic terms, uh, there are, the picture is quite more um, optimistic, there are signs of economic resilience. So after the second quarter of 2020, which was difficult for everyone, Slovenian GDP contracted then in for about 13%. But since then, um, there are signs of, of recovery mainly due to strong foreign demand. So exports have been growing, manufacturing has been growing since then, construction has been strong, but of course services and retail trade uh, were still very badly hit. Um, and as you can see, went down together with, with uh, the lockdown periods. And because of that, at VEV, we uh, project a recovery um, should happen until 2022 this year and the next uh, growth should uh, be in in the ballpark of, of four percent um, so this um, uh, situation is less difficult than it is for some other countries also due to government support um, the fiscal policy stance has been very expansionary uh, government invested about five percent of gdp in 2020 for various support measures these seemingly have cushioned the fall in GDP uh, by some estimates uh, for about three percentage points. They prevented a large drop in unemployment, but the trade-off for that are of course the uh, increased uh, debts, a large deficit. So the so public debt is, is again at uh, financial crisis levels, levels or even uh, more. Now looking uh, to the future, coming to the last part of this presentation, I said there would be two caveats to the claim that Slovenia is uh, the regional front runner in economic terms. The first one I said is it is, but not as convincingly as before. Um, the second caveat is, is this even a relevant question? I think other Slovenian speakers today would, would agree with me when I say that this comparison with other transition economies was never as relevant as the comparison to the north and to the west, where the appetites have been set fairly on and unfairly, these appetites were large. But nevertheless, I think the fair, a fair question for the next 30 years is to ask, can Slovenia bridge the gap to the most developed parts of the EU? Um, I collected here a few indicators which give some, some insight on, 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 on the kind of long-term uh, developmental prospects and what you see here is just a comparison of the Slovenian value to the value of Austria and Germany and to the average of, of all the new uh, EU member states. So what you see are not absolute values but just comparisons of the, the values of these indicators. So if you go from top to bottom, if you look at research and development exp expenditure compared to Austria, Germany, uh, 50 percentage points smaller. Uh, if you look at the pace of the green transformation, the GDP intensity of this, the carbon intensity of GDP, which simply shows 
the amount of uh, environmental impacts per unit of GDP produced is, is here, less is better. Uh, so here again, the, there's a gap of about, let's say 25 percentage point. Labor productivity is, is, is uh, lagging behind. And of course, the consequence of this is a large um, uh, gap in, in salaries. So if we look at net earnings, here, of course, tax differences play a role, but nevertheless, you can see an average annual net uh, salary is still twice as high in, in Germany as in Austria. And this is, of course, a kind of sobering picture. Um, I don't want to make an ass assessment if it's possible, if Slovenia will bridge this gap in the next 30 years. Uh, in my view, what needs to be done is not just improvements in the legal system, political system, overall business environment, but what is needed is a kind of uh, developmental leap, leapfrogging. So considerable investments in, 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 in the green transformation in, in dig digitalization and so on. Um, whether this will happen uh, is of course impossible to predict. I would say the current situation is not as rosy. There's a sense of pessimism in this regard, but still if we take a step back um, and look at the first 30 years, which I think we're still in economic terms, at least a success, I think there are reasons to be cautiously, cautiously optimistic, but certainly um, scenarios which, which, which feature a kind of steady growth and steady development are, are very, very likely. Whether more of that will happen, we'll just, um, we'll just have to wait and see. So I will finish here and hopefully um, we can continue this discussion uh, later. So thank you. Thank you very much, Nico, even one minute ahead of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, thank you for this very interesting insight on Slovenia as a front runner who is uh, not necessarily considering itself a front runner because it's not so much looking behind at the ones following, but uh, rather at the ones which are ahead and uh, which uh, which need to still need to be overtaken. Um, okay, so um, we will come from the economy to politics, and uh, now Meta has the floor on. Uh, Slovenian democracy. Thank you very much. Just a second that I share my screen. Okay, sorry about that. I think you're able now to see uh, our, our slides. Uh, as announced at the beginning, uh, this presentation was prepared by me and my colleague, uh, Linka Krasovic. And in this paper, we look at the different angles of Slovenians' position in internationally, mainly in the quality of democracy. Uh, so we ask ourselves, is uh, Slovenia still a consolidated democracy and a stable, uh, with a stable party politics? Uh, in through the 1990s, Slovenia was quite successful and has gone through, through three su successful transformation, uh, national, economic, and uh, democratic. And in the view of different uh, indexes of quality of democracy and ranking institutions, such as uh, Nations in Transit and Bertelsmann Transformation Index, it was viewed as rather successful uh, and even uh, marked as a good pupil. Uh, this was not such a surprise given the different factors such as uh, socioeconomic development, civil society's level of development, uh, institutional choices, and favorable external factors. Uh, especially superior economic position, as we heard in the first presentation, a homogeneous population with absence of longer war contributed that the Slovenia uh, quite um, we can say confidently transformed uh, to consolidated democracy uh, and was described by uh, Bertelsmann Transformation Index as consolidated democracy with sort of little confidence in the party system and high level of corruption, so those sidebacks. Uh, so in this presentation, we ask ourselves, uh, is this still true, especially if we look at those uh, ranking institutions and we know that these reports usually take into account sort of the recent year and are sort of a year or two behind. Um, so we basically uh, took up this approach of uh, in looking at uh, the quantitative uh, view of these indexes and also taking into account the qualitative view and look at the recent challenges that haven't been included yet in the 
report. Uh, but if we first look at the position of uh, Slovenia regarding uh, in relation to the other countries in its neighborhood, we can see a sort of a similar uh, position as in uh, terms of um, economic development. Uh, so these are the data all regarding the index of democracy score, uh, which is prepared by the nations in transit. Uh, the scale goes from one to seven, where one is the consolidated democracy. So uh, the lower, the better. Uh, so we can see that Slovenia remains here, uh, sort of still a front runner, uh, which was uh, especially in the recent years overtaken only by Estonia. The rest of the countries uh, in uh, the region are sort of behind. Uh, but uh, although we can see uh, sort of more evident um, the evident uh, data of backsliding, especially in Poland with a pink line and in Hungary with this gray line, we can also notice a bit of a backslide also here in Slovenia, which is a sort of a steady but very slow one through the last years. Uh, this, of course, doesn't include uh, the recent uh, event as well as it, uh, only, it as well as it only looks at the democracy score altogether, but not at different factors. Uh, so if we look at the different factors that are composed into the democracy score, uh, this is only for Slovenia, but through the whole period uh, from 1997 to today, uh, we can see here that. Uh, the sort of the lowest is the uh, is sort of the index or the score of uh, corruption. So the problem of the corruption is the most pressing. Um, also increasing is the uh, issue with the independence of media, which will be also addressed in one of the presentations. Uh, so a rather steady index remains the electoral process, which improved actually during the first year and remains steady for all other we could see a um, slight decrease in its value. Uh, so if we look at the more qualitative view and uh, take into account also uh, the current advance that have taken place mainly in the last few years, uh, those um, events that haven't been necessarily already included in these measures, we can see that uh, there were several change challenges to democracy. Uh, first one, of course, the pandemic and the health crisis with different health measures, which sort of represented uh, a challenges also of the uh, free expression. Uh, then we have, sorry about that, uh, political crisis, especially concerning the changes of the government, a uh, high sort of dissatisfaction with uh, the um, political parties and uh, sort of, uh, with the state of democracy and trust in the institutions, um, as well as sort of other events such as cases of short-term procedures of several amendment acts, accusations, several accusations of corruption and disputes with public institutions from uh, national radio and television, Slovenian press agency to also the decisions of the constitutional court. Uh, but alongside these challenges, we could also notice a stronger social movement. Um, during the last year, we have constant intergovernmental protests uh, and also other types of protests, which sort of show an increase in the political participation and engagement, especially of civil society, although at the same time, this civil society is itself facing a lot of challenges, uh, some also coming from, from the government. If we look at the party system, we can say that Slovenia has proportional representation system, which enables a large numbers of parties to enter the parliament. Traditionally, the parties uh, that were in the parliament came from transformed parties uh, from the previous system and newly established parties. But since 2011, we have noticed more new parties that have been more successful also in terms of leading the government or winning the elections. Uh, so this new situation has been described by Professor Fink Hafner as stably destabilized. Uh, together with this, we could also notice huge disappointment with politicians and political institutions, especially political parties. Regarding the coalition government, 
um, coalitions are usually uh, coalitions of several parties. Um, and uh, those have been since 2004 ideologically co uh, coherent coalitions with ideologically similar oppositions. Uh, what uh, is also characteristic for them is dropping out pattern. For most of the government, at least one party dropped out, uh, some leading also to early elections. In the, at the same time, most of the parliamentary parties also hold a high coalition potential. Uh, Slovenia is also uh, has this traditionally neo-corporatist arrangement, which led from the devo development to a random and fragmented social dialogue with the social partners. And this disintegration of neo-corporatist structures sort of leads also to lowering governance capacity. Uh, I would like to present one more um, fact or one more uh, view on this, namely the external relations of uh, Slovenia. And here, the most important is sort of the EU relations. Uh, Slovenia has remained pro-European uh, since uh, its beginnings after the independence when it sort of showed the interest to join the EU, despite the fact that in the last years we witnessed also some Eurosceptic tendencies. Uh, but nevertheless, the Europeanization remained strong. Uh, and at the beginning, we could describe it also as a kind of a substitute for the old ideology. Uh, the main criticism here remains the absence of clear goals and strategies that uh, Slovenia would take as a position within the EU. Uh, but in the recent year, we have also seen a move to more Visegrad state politics from those previously defined, sort of uh, sticking more to the positions of Germany and France, and later on uh, the Low Countries or uh, Benelux. If uh, I present you a short conclusion, we can say that based on the, our analysis, we didn't come to the very conclusive results. Um, while on one hand, based on several characteristics of Slovenia, Slovenia remains high on democracy status. On the other hand, we can also witness uh, new, new challenges to democracy quality, and this can uh, certainly show a need for further and deeper research. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I, I think it's also pretty much in line your final assessment of uh, that uh, the, the development is, is pretty much open. Uh, looking at the Nations in Transit report that just recently came out, where Slovenia has a slightly lowered score, I think, but is pretty much at the same level that it had been before. So um, we have a, a system which is now much more destabilized in party politics terms than before. But what I take from this now also a system somehow looking for a new ideology or maybe uh, for a new narrative uh, to look to its own future because the, the old one has not passed but somehow been fulfilled with Europeanization. Um, thank you very much. So uh, we can proceed to, uh, to the next presentation uh, on, on a similar issue but from a different uh, point of view, more from a legal perspective. And Matej, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation for having organized uh, this debate um, today. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, I have been asked to address a question of whether Slovenia is constitutionally backsliding uh, today. And for the audience that might be less uh, experienced, uh, might, they, might, they might not be experts in constitutional terminology, it is first of all important to explain what is actually meant uh, by constitutional backsliding. Uh, it means that certainly there are certain standards of constitutional democracy and that the country which has already reached apparently those standards is now going backwards, is now rolling its own development uh, backwards. And constitutional democracy uh, signals, uh, it's, it's a system of government uh, where not only majorities rule, but when these majorities rule, they have to do this in accordance uh, with the constitution so that everyone is treated freely and equally non-arbitrarily and that in a society uh, which is pluralist all the way down and all the way up, uh, protection of human rights 
and fundamental freedoms uh, prevail. So in a certain sense, and also what we've, we've heard from the preceding uh, speakers, it is quite a remarkable question. It is quite remarkable that this question is posed uh, in the first place, because as you know, this question goes against the grain of the dominant narrative about Slovenia. Slovenia has always been from the very beginning uh, considered as the best disciple, as the best disciple among the uh, new member states of the European Union, as a role model for the, for the other countries in the Western Balkans uh, to follow. And yet, as, you, as some of the speakers have already indicated, and you yourself, Christian, over 12 years, this narrative has seen a profound shift. All of a sudden, the best disciple is subject to an authoritarian turn, and we are uh, also, according to the, especially to the narratives that are circulating in Slovenia, we are witnessing uh, a straight, uh, straight cut uh, dictatorship. I've all, uh, myself, as an academic, as a, as a non-partisan critical observer, I've always had a, a deep problem with both of the narratives. And because I believe both of these narratives are not accurate and it tells a lot also about the narrators that are spreading those uh, narratives. I believe that if we look at the 30 years of development of the Republic of Slovenia, and if we move beyond just the formal infrastructure of the state, if we delve deep down into the way things are, in the way things sociologically function, then it's really hard to argue that Slovenia has been the best disciple uh, in the room. And for that matter, it is also very hard to directly answer the question whether Slovenia is constitutionally backsliding. To a certain extent, yes, Slovenia is formally, has been formally constitutionally backsliding over the last 10 or even 15 years. But even more importantly, I would argue, the problem of Slovenia is that most of the standards of constitutional democracy have been met just on paper. And that the discrepancy between what has formally been achieved, what has been on paper, and what is actually been going on on the ground, sociologically, politically, in terms of the actual functioning of judicial systems, system, administrative system, system of the state, I think that discrepancy has been growing. Which means that in, a, in, a, in the most important sense, uh, we cannot say that Slovenia is actually constitutionally backsliding only now, but that simply certain constitutional standards have de facto never been properly achieved. And what is the reason for that? Uh, what is the reason for this argument? I, I present, I defend this argument in a book length, uh, in a book that's been recently published by Hart Publishing. Uh, I'm arguing that paradoxically, the, 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 the failure of Slovenian transition in terms of constitutional democracy can be explained precisely by the factor for which Slovenia or, or of which Slovenia has been most celebrated for. And that is this idea of the smooth transition. The idea of the smooth transition that was particularly visible and particularly, as also Nico indicated today already, that was particularly uh, visible through the specific Slovenian economic development. Uh, in contrast to other Central and Eastern European uh, states, uh, what Slovene, the kind of economic model that Slovenia inaugurated was an economic model of a state-owned capitalism. That meant that most of the, the state's economy was kept under the ownership of the state. And the rest that, that was privatized at the time, at the, beginning of the uh, of the, at the beginning of the 1990s, that privatization went into the hands, into the coffers, into the suitcases of the individuals, of the groups that were close to the elite that was then in power. And this has created a specific economic monopoly. And this monopoly has been controlled, and that is sociologically proven, by the successors of the communist elite. So it has been the post-communist left that has, over the last 30 years, politically for, for 23 years controlled the, the organs of the state, but economically they have had basically a monopoly uh, in the Slovenian economic model of governance. 
And this economic monopoly has stifled pluralism, has stifled free and fair competition on the basis of meritocracy across all other domains of the functioning of the state. The economic monopoly of the post-communist left translated itself in the political uh, monopoly. I said the changing in government, the changes in government have been very rare in Slovenia. And whenever they, they, they happen, the, the, the situation is, in Slovenia is as if we were on the verge of a revolution, as it is a situation, as it is a situation now. And this, and this eco economic and political monopoly consequently also translated in the educational sector, the media sector, and the civil society sector. Indeed, all these sectors have been extremely ideo ideologically homogenous because they were dependent on the state public fundings, and these public fundings were controlled uh, by the specific uh, retention elite. And since the, as, as the educational sector, I mean, there one has to, one has to point out that the, you know, the, the biggest trade union in the educational sector is run by an individual who is a, a front runner, who is a member of the radical political left. The, the universities as such has been typically governed by the so, social democrats. They have appointed rectors, they have appointed ministers. And this is simply, it's a state of, it, it, it's a fact that, that points out that this, the very pluralism in the educational sector is missing. The media, I'm quite amazed that in over the last 12 months, we have heard so much concerned voices about the attacks on the independent media, attacks on journalists, um, and all the, all, 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 the, all, all the rest. But frankly speaking, the, the media independence have been, has been problematic over the entire three decades of Slovenian uh, political existence. Ownership has been murky, has been non-transparent, has been media, the media have been owned by local tycoons, hand in hand working with that or another uh, government. And at that time, I haven't heard basically any protests on the side of the journalist associations, which I, which I think speaks a little bit about the level of professional uh, integrity um, of those, of those, uh, narrow, uh, of those of those uh, individuals. So the, 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 since I'm running out of time, I believe that the, the problem of Slovenia has been, that the political agenda in Slovenia has been how to preserve the status quo, how to preserve these monopolies by all possible means. And this status quo has resulted in the institutional decay in an essentially imploded political spectrum. We in Slovenia have two or three serious political parties. The rest are single issue and single person political parties. As I already said, the discrepancy between the law and books and the way things actually function is growing. And the informal networks have, been, have had prevalence, have been stronger than the formal institutions. And what we have seen is that rather than the rule that the law would be ruling, that we would have the rule of law, more and more the, we have have governance in which the, the institutions, the powerful individuals, the factional, the factions have been governing with the law. So what is next? Uh, what is uh, the future? I think there are three possible scenarios for the future. Either we will see by some way, by some miracle happening, collapse of the status quo and the emergence of a properly so-called constitutional democracy based of pluralism, uh, political fairness, political liberalism, uh, fair competition, non-arbitrariness, the governance of the rule of law. All we will see in contrast to that, the re-establishment of the, of the status quo that we've had for 30 years, or maybe we will see the, the turn to the so-called illiberal uh, democracy of that Central and Eastern European uh, type. Uh, actually, everything is uh, on the table, uh, and I think the, the, the future direction of this state has never been as uncertain as it is at, at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matej. And um, I think this is, a, this is a very interesting argument we should uh, debate about in the uh, in the round of discussion, because it actually turns uh, the the existing narrative a bit upside down, uh, painting 
Slovenia more like a country uh, reformed by the former ruling elite uh, in the manner of, of Romania or Bulgaria in the past and uh, not as the, the front running reformer as it's usually portrayed. So it would be great if the others could uh, comment on this in the in the next round and Speller maybe uh, already now uh, and I give the floor to her for uh, the final presentation. Thank you, Christian, and thank you also everybody in front of me. It uh, there was like there were like very interesting presentations. Um, I would like to. I will. I will. I will uh, start with answering your first, uh, question. So, is Slovenia still a regional fourth runner? My answer is no. At, the, at least not in regards of media freedom. And I will also not agree with my uh, with the previous speaker, of course, uh, and also not with his narrative. Uh, I think that situation down, downgraded, that, that is true, through the last two decades and has turned to the worst in the last year. Uh, I also agree with the, with the notion that Slovenia was a, was a good pupil. Uh, because uh, where in the time when Slovenia was approaching EU and our legislation was harmonizing, Slovenia passed numerous laws that were advanced even on EU level. Our pub public broadcaster regulation was seated by Council of Europe uh, and offered as role model law in the region. Uh, program board members were appointed directly from civil society, which was the most democratic system that to the some extent excluded politics from the management of the public broadcaster. Uh, the mass media act that was adopted in 2001 was not so advanced, but for example, the freedom of informa information law was then one of the best in Europe. So the other, so the, the Slovenia was a, a, go, a good pupil at, at the beginning of, of entering to European or it, even in the, in the time of when it was still a candidate uh, country. Uh, also, there is another fact. The fact is that Slovenia were in the forefront of democratization uh, and independence process of Slovenia in the 80s. Prominent intellectuals gathered around magazines like Nova Revia and Mladina and were thinking independence be before it even came to politi political agenda. Uh, through media, boundaries of media of freedom of speech were tested while Slovenia was still part of the Yugoslavia. Media freedom was a huge part of independence process and was respected as one of the pillars of our new democracy. Since then, situation changed dramatically. After we entered into EU, it became obvious that even old EU members states have democratic de deficits on different levels. Our politicians realized that we can deviate from the highest expectations, and of course we did. Uh, under the first, uh, the media, the, the changes to media legislation um, were, were made, the substantial changes under the first uh, Yanis Janša's government in two 2005. Uh, first was the law on radio television of Slovenia. Um, uh, the law was challenged on a referendum that was not successful. The consequence is that the division of political power in the parliament is now mirrored in the composition of the program board of our public broadcaster, which leads to politicization of, the, of its decisions, including appointment of director general. Also, the last significant change to the mass media law was made in 2006 uh, under the first Janša's government. Also, journalist organization, organizations protest against the changes because they were driven by introducing ideological revisions of contents of Slovene media and not the development of the sector. All other governments later were not successful in reforming the media legislation that is now totally outdated and not responding to the challenges of dig digital transformation. 
Uh, I have to state that the Journalist Association holds all central and central left government as equally responsible to the poor state that our media legislation is now in. Uh, in 2000s, we could witness ownership consolidation of Slovene media. This consolidation was marked by exploitation of weak wording of the media law that enabled trading with analog frequencies that were distributed for free as public good. Local radio stations were merged into larger networks. The consequence, the consequence was commercialization and loss of local information. TV markets were, market was similarly consolidated. Although the law prohibits cross ownership of print, radio and television, large ownership octopus of mother and numerous sub subsidiary uh, companies formed owning magazines, radio station, newspapers and news portals. Ministry of Culture more or less just observed those processes and haven't intervened. Uh, also, there is a problem with the ownership of our daily newspaper because the core business of Slovene newspaper owners is not publishing. Um, so other commercial interests of the daily's uh, ownership are influencing in editorial decisions. I won't go more into what is happening uh, in what was happening in these 30 years because I don't have time and we'll, we'll jump to now, to this uh, last year. Probably you noticed all sorts of concerns were raised about media freedom in Slovenia under not so new anymore, a new uh, yeah, a government of Janis Janša. His attitude toward media and journalists is deriving from the presumption that Slovene mainstream media are biased to the left. Prime Minister expressed his view on the Slovene media landscape in a public statement that he titled War with Media. As the S party has, expired, has aspired to build its own media system over the last 20 years. In 2021, they are approaching the goal with the help of Hungarian investments. The core of the system consists of Weekly Democracia, Portal Democracia, TV channel Nova24, news portal Nova24, and network of local online portals. Under the influence of SDS is also new portal Seolnet and uh, television uh, station Planet TV, which was bought by Hungarians recently. I have to say that one of the first moves of the government was to change the media legislation. What was proposed last summer was essentially to defund um, our public broadcasting, reducing yearly income by 8 million euros. Um, uh, also, there was changing, the, uh, the change, change, changes was proposed to the Slovene press agency law. Uh, the government uh, wanted to gain control over the agency by uh, through appointing the members of its supervisory board. Um, all proposals were put on hold because there was such a criticism and opposition against these proposals and the, the laws are still like in a drawer, but uh, the threat is still imminent that this government will take them on and, and go, go further with them. Probably also uh, are familiar with the pressures uh, that the government is exercising over Slovene press agency. Uh, the, the government stopped funding the agency in November 2020, jeopardizing the survival of the professional and autonomous agency and jobs about around uh, 100 employees. Uh, so the, 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 S, the agency is now without funding for almost uh, one, uh, 170 days. Uh, the association launched crowdfunding campaign, 270,000 euros were, were, were donated to the agency, which will secure for we are estimating two months of, of, uh, of uh, salaries payment after that. Uh, I mean, the agency is battling uh, the state on court. So uh, 
uh, we hope that this procedure will be uh, finished soon so because the existence of the agency uh, depends upon it you know that one one of the main activities of slovene association in the last we, year was unfortunately responding to attacks on media and journalists uh, we uh, published a report on that we were monitoring the attacks for two years so on our web page you can see the report uh, attacks range from uh, smear campaigns, um, uh, attacks uh, sending by post, uh, sending like white pipe powder to journalists. Um, to the smear campaigns are the vast majority, and of, of course, online harassment. The vast majority of smear campaigns against journalists are published in the media that are close to SDS and founded by SDS. A great number of articles there is dealing with uh, reporting, uh, jour journalists reporting and with the media. Um, the language uh, used there is very offensive, naming journalists as anti ansha socialist, leftist, media assassin, warriors of certain ag agenda. But the ugly smear is found in the comments section under those articles and in social media posts by trolls. It looks like that the whole operation is well organized because journalists are reporting about the same scenario in which attacks are unfolding every time. Our prime minister, as you already know, is already famous for his Twitter activity. Uh, New York Times addressed this yesterday. I think uh, it, it stated very well. Uh, I, I'm sitting now, the, Euro, no, the New York Times, they, they wrote, with Mr. Trump now banned from Twitter, Mr. Jansha has taken his place, albeit with far fewer, fewer followers, in setting the benchmark for, for intemperate social media messaging by the national leader. Many of these insults are directed to journalists and media. Targets of these uh, attacks are more, more or less critical journalists, mainly those who cover internal affairs, investigative journalists, TV anchors, and journalists, uh, especially those working for the uh, journal, yeah, and women journalists uh, working for the public broadcasters. Uh, wo women are targeted more often and more severely. The language is much more brutal. I'm just uh, saying few of the insults like prostitutes, horse, feminist horse, fascist horse, can't ugly, all sorts and all sorts of very direct sexual comments. Uh, government hostility towards Slovene media sector can be seen even in measures that were taken to counter the negative effects of the pandemic. In Slovenia, there was no state help for media outlets specifically. Ministry last year even delayed the payment process of programs that were already selected for co-funding in the previous annual media tender. The contracts were signed just before the pandemic was declared. Uh, media finally received their grant amounts in full in November 2020. The results of this year government's co-funding scheme were another scandal number of media outlets have failed to secure state funding and thus face financial struggles. Main reason for rejection of the applications were their alleged media bias. So to conclude, I would say that I don't share the views of uh, my the previous presenter, I think that uh, this, governor, this government had expressed unprecedented attacks. Uh, I mean, you saw the range of the attacks. I don't say that we, we weren't having problems before we did, and I addressed some of them. Uh, the, the, media, the outdated media legislation, this is for sure problems of all political parties. Um, in independent Slovenia. So yes, there were problems, but uh, the press freedom is under attack uh, in the last year, like in, pre in unprecedented uh, um, um, measures. 
no, not the not the right word. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I think we still have independent journalism, but the question is for how long media can and journalists can withstand such pressures without major major influence on their reporting. Thank you very much uh, for these insights into the the media situation. Um, I took from this that we have seen legislation changes also in the past during during former governments um, there uh, is a, a lot of pressure and a very vicious climate which was also reported a lot in the international media um, maybe we should talk in the uh, in the latter round also about uh, in how far really lasting changes have been made since last year so uh, based on the legislation based on the ownership structure what has, has really changed there that might outlive the, the government. Um, but for now, um, I would like to encourage the audience to, to continue putting their questions uh, for the second round. I would like to start the first round now myself uh, with Nico and coming back to his presentation and maybe uh, provoking him a bit on the, uh, on the slide he showed on the uh, purchasing power parity, GDP per capita, because if you look at the development, it seemed to me a bit like that um, Slovenia is, is clearly above the others, that's that's right, but still uh, you see, for example, in the last decade, the, the Visegrad countries skyrocketing somehow from, from the middle upwards, whereas Slovenia looks more like stagnating almost. They, they are up right from the start and they're still up in the end, but it's almost a flat line. It's almost parallel to the Western Balkan countries, but just a huge difference uh, between the, the actual state. So um, what would you say if, could you speak about uh, some kind of stagnation here? Uh, how would you rate this? And is there currently any debate or vision um, how to get beyond this, this kind of development? And maybe picking up the uh, the leading democracy score now of Estonia to uh, to Slovenia, uh, Slovenia's economic development. Uh, what can can Slovenia maybe learn from countries like Estonia, which which has a very strong digital vision of its its future, its economy and uh, its development? Path? Yeah, so that's a really great question. Now, a part of this are obviously reasons, you know, why Visegrad countries, for example, grew where Slovenia isn't it didn't reasons of course partly lie also in those economies yeah so i don't want to go into this why they grew but let's instead focus on on, on slovenia i think so like like you said i mean if you look at gdp gdp was growing in this sense there is no stagnation stagnation is of course in the sense of 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 of, of let's say long term development of this narrative or feeling where Slovenia is going and this I alluded to this and also I think Meta had a nice expression a sort of emptiness of vision which I think has happened so as was mentioned there was a certain economic model let's say growth growth program which lasted until the economic crisis well for whatever reasons this is now over yeah this amount of state ownership has decreased banks were privatized and so on so this is a different situation um, why there was stagnation in the last 10 years? I mentioned some of the reasons. I think partly this is also because governments were short-lived and weak. None of the governments since 2008 ended their term um, in, in four years. So also the reform pro progress was has stalled. But a bigger part of this is, as I mentioned, is a kind of yeah, this emptiness of vision. Yeah, no, obviously, when you talk about economic policy, there's never any agreement of what should be done. Yeah, but but there just seems to be, at least in the, on the level of political parties, a lack of, of vision and, 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 and ambition. Because on one on one side, yeah, there is a lot of, 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 of um, continua continuation of the status quo. But on the other, and I'm not now saying like left and right, but just where ideas come from, there's little less on the idea side than, than these kind of standard, let's call them, you know, market reforms, some might say neoliberal reforms and so on. Um, and what is missing is a kind of a, a, a real discussion on what, what it takes for, for a society to move from wealthy to very rich. Yeah, now 
which is the last European country that managed to do this? Ireland. Ireland is a tax haven. Uh, so this is probably not the, the way we, we want to go. Um, but um, I think you mentioned Estonia, which is obviously ahead in the in in, in digitalization. But so but I mean the question is how do we how do we get there and how did they get there? Yeah, so what does it take for a country to decide? Yeah, we will become the leading, the most digital country in Europe. Uh, I don't know the Estonian situation very well, but I, I would argue it takes some kind of uh, uh, of, of policy ambitiousness, investments, also financial investments, and a kind of collective vision. And here, of course, for ten years or even more, there's just no no consensus and no real program. And you can also see this right now when there's a lot of funding available for the for the recovery fund from the EU. I think Slovenia plans to, to spend, I think, 1.9 or 1.6 billion euros of, of, of funds and then another, um, I think it's some, something less than a billion of, of loans. But if you look at the program, which is supposed to be allocated for the green transformation, for the digitalization, which are really the, the ways the societies will have to develop in the next decade or even more. Uh, this plan, at least according to most analysis, is just not suited for this purpose, which unfortunately has to do with this government's uh, orientation. Uh, for you know, if we speak of the green transformation of the whole, uh, this whole area, it's I mean, at least one gets the sense that this is just something they would use. In, in, in the whole spectrum of cultural wars. If they could, they would deny climate change. They cannot because we are in the EU. But nevertheless, you see the offshoots of this in this plan, which simply does not allocate funds to those areas which could really deliver um, a kind of, you know, a next stage in development. And, but um, sorry, yeah. uh, is there somebody who, who has this kind of vision that you would say, okay, there is some kind of uh, debate among, any actors in the country who say that, okay, we have digital Estonia, we can have green Slovenia or something like this. There's a lot of funds yeah. who actually see the situation. We have the money, we have the preconditions. So let's, let's build this. You know, very little, very little, uh, unfortunately, in the programs of political parties. Now, I, I don't want to advocate for anyone, but at least this last year we had uh, the economist Jorge Damian, who at least came up with the program, and the program said, you know, things like let's hire, let's fund a hundred research research PhDs, and let's you know, fund their positions and 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 make sure they stay in Slovenia or something like that. But these are the kinds of you know real, concrete and pragmatic ways you can advance, uh, and not just through what's then usually offered, you know, uh, lower taxes and 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 this kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so not <laughs> really optimistic picture here uh, you paint. Um, I would like to come now uh, to Alenka and um, focus on the, the potential development of party politics, because if you think about the, the question you're answering in the presentation uh, you, you both have, then uh, it's about consolidated democracy, is it going into a direction of backsliding? And if we look at the countries where backsliding is usually analyzed, like Poland and Hungary in the region, you see that uh, it usually takes a very strong party for this. You have a party with a, a super majority or at least an absolute majority governing, uh, which is able to implement all these changes they want to do. But if you look at Slovenia, you don't really have a party like this. And um, as you write in your paper, um, also, the, the current prime minister is a very polarizing figure. So this sounds to me a bit like there's also not necessarily a lot of voter reservoir left to, to be grabbed. Because if you polarize, then you usually you have your camp closely behind yourself, but uh, you, you cannot really win easily from the others. So uh, it seems to me a bit that real backsliding is, is a bit uh, out of range, even considering this situation in the party system. Uh, what is your take on this? Um, yes, I I agree, of course, with uh, your observation uh, that um, uh, clear majorities are needed uh, to to change um, the pattern of um, consolidation of democracy. So we can is one precondition that we can start 
to also to think about more seriously about democratic backsliding. And um, uh, in Slovenia, Slovenia has a proportional electoral system with a four percentage, uh, four percent threshold. That means that quite a lot of political parties has have been um, uh, in the parliament uh, all the time, between seven and nine, actually. And um, uh, it's uh, not. Uh, I mean. Uh, in in uh, in 30 years of uh, of slovenian independence actually only um, twice uh, political party one political party was let's say in slovenian terms more predominantly not actually in political science terms predominantly so um, it was party of miro Cera, uh, in 2000 uh, which uh, won elections uh, in 2014 and it was also um, uh, liberal democracy of Slovenia, which was also very powerful political party at one point, not all the time. It was liberal democracy of Slovenia was um, a leading governmental party, but it was very powerful um, actually only after one elections, uh, after elections in 2000, for example. Um, so uh, it was possible, for example, uh, to um, uh, to find or to follow some ideas presented by um, Slovene Democratic Party and uh, its leader to current prime minister, Janis Janša, already in the past, that it's necessary to establish a second republic in Slovenia. Um, and um, as I understood, uh, one part of the uh, idea to how to reach this uh, goal was also an idea to change an electoral system um, so that uh, Slovenia will, would give up a proportional electoral system. Uh, but uh, to change an electoral system in Slovenia is not an easy task. Uh, and uh, this was possible to, um, to, to, to see in the last two years, two, three years, two years when the constitutional court decided that some changes had to be implemented and uh, parties needed actually two, two years, I think two years, to implement some small changes. Uh, because you need, um, uh, you need um, majority to, uh, to uh, for, for example, to uh, radically, to change uh, the electoral system radically. For example, to switch from uh, from proportional electoral system to uh, one kind of a majority system, for example. But uh, I, I think that um, uh, in the last uh, several years, in the last I don't know five four years, uh, it was not possible, for example, to hear such uh, calls to change an electoral system, to radically change electoral system made by a uh, Slovene Democratic Party. So it was an idea to establish a second republic, but um, it was very uh, publicly announced idea. But uh, now, um, sometimes I have a feeling that um, the, the, some political parties, uh, including uh, governmental leading governmental party uh, at the time is not um, presenting this idea very publicly anymore but uh, the, there are still some ideas how to change maybe some institutions or some institutional uh, settings in Slovenia but um, uh, excuse me but but, but Matej is um, uh, an expert for a uh, lot of questions <laughs> yeah, um, this is a very interesting uh, point that uh, what you are referring to is closer to what political science call a manufactured majority, changing the electoral system to have a majority for your party, even though you don't have a majority in the electorate. But what about an earned majority? Is it feasible that, uh, that a single party under the current circumstances would get uh, something even close to an absolute majority uh, if you speak about the system of uh, stable instability, because to me this could mean the same in both ways. It could there could be concentration uh, towards a party, but it could also be a complete fragmentation and this high number of uh, of parties in parliament continued. Well, uh, there have been several several ideas that uh, so-called center-left political parties supposed to um, 
make a kind of a pre-electoral coalition even. Um, because I, I, I think that at the moment it is uh, quite clear if the elections would be held, uh, Slovene Democratic Party would be the winner. Uh, but the question is uh, whether there will be coalition partners available, for example, for this party after the uh, parliamentary elections, uh, probably next year. Uh, so it, 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 it is a question whether um, is it possible for um, this political party from Slovene Democratic Party, is it possible for uh, the party to uh, again form a governmental coalition after the elections? And um, uh, actually, actually, we will see. A bit <laughs> but, like the situation of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, it sounds, uh, in Israel. So uh, a, a successful party, but uh, not successful enough to win a majority. And yes, I mean, this yeah. already happened after elections 2018, for example, when the Slovene Democratic Party won the elections, so won the biggest share of votes. But um, other political part, parliamentary political parties um, were actually not willing, or majority of them were not willing to enter um, in the coalition led by um, Slovene Democratic Party or by Janis Janša concretely. But um, it, it, it was possible to see that, uh, for example, um, some changes on party positions can also have an influence on political developments in Slovenia. For example, Miro Cera uh, assured he's not going to enter the coalition with uh, Slovene Democratic Party. Um, and uh, the same was uh, actually um, said by the leader of Democratic Party of retired persons, uh, Karel Ryavets. But uh, after the changes on um, on the party on the leadership position in two parties, uh, we could see that two political parties, Party of Miro Cera, Party of Modern Center, and the Democratic Party of Retired Persons uh, changed the initial positions um, uh, into in 2020 at the beginning of 2020. Mm -hmm. So. Um... It's interesting to hear that there's also on the on the left uh, a tendency for for concentration or maybe joining forces, um, and that that there's also somehow at least a tendency that the the party system could become more concentrated at least in the form of electoral coalitions, uh, which which we also see in a couple of other countries like like Hungary, for example. Um, okay, so uh, I would like to continue to Mate and um, we uh, we have one question in the from the audience I, I would already add now to your question and this is uh, or it's a statement but I will reformulate it as a question uh, can you maybe point to to data that would uh, link to your to your argument or to support the argument and uh, my original question uh, would be um, uh, you argue that there is somehow a, a linkage between economic pluralism and political pluralism, uh, and the latter is uh, is limited by the limitation of the former. Um, so as we now see changes implemented by the new government, and uh, Alenka also said this, the idea of a second republic and, and stuff like this, uh, would you say that this now means that we're not uh, if we're not uh, witnessing backsliding now, are we witnessing actually a development towards more democratic pluralism because uh, the, the situation that limited pluralism before uh, is starting to change? Because this would from, be for me the, the logical next step from, uh, from this point. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, yes, I, I, I've seen that um, uh, somebody invited me to provide more data, uh, database arguments. As I, as I noted, um, I, I published a book on that. So the, the interested are, those who are interested are re very welcome to, uh, to read it. Um, and so in terms of, you know, the fact that there is a conflict in a society proves that there is a degree of pluralism, right? So if in some societies there is no conflict because one side is just so strong, it stifles any kind of opposition. So this certainly leads 
um, to the it, it gives more life and more uh, more wings to to pluralism, but. Um, it, it certainly doesn't mean that uh, what I'm going to say in the, in the following is that um, I, I do support and I do endorse this kind of conflicts. I, I do believe that it's, um, it's utterly uh, inappropriate, it's undignified, uh, it's not worthy of a statesman, and it's certainly uh, not in line with good, let alone of best, best practices the way the prime minister of Slovenia behave, uh, is, behaves, especially on the on the internet and Twitter. But with him is, you know, Car, it's it, the, the thing is what you see is what you get. So everyone can see uh, what's going on and everyone can criticize that and be critical for many, uh, for many reasons. And that's a fact. Uh, and there are also other facts that I have been referring to in my, in my talk. And these aren't just my personal views. We have to distinguish between views and purse and facts. And I do regret that, um, especially in journalism in Slovenia, has become, is, is, is really departing from the professional standards. And it's no longer about you know, reporting facts, having disputes about the facts, but it's just about views and imposing uh, certain views. And one important fact, which will demonstrate to you who is actually in charge in the media spectrum or who has been in charge, for example, of the public broadcaster, which is now allegedly under uh, answer, insurmountable attack. Um, we, we already heard today that until 2007, there was a law in place that, uh, that, that was the, the NGOs had, the, the, had the, the most of the say who's going to lead uh, the program council of the national uh, broadcaster public broadcaster and those and those NGOs apparently appointed Janusz Kocjancic who was a former communist icon and the president of social democrats five years later another president of this pro program uh, program council of the public broadcaster was a vice president Yevne Pikalo vice president of the social democrats so what I'm saying is that it's clear that there is a certain the certain political party and its loyalists, these are the, the successors of the, of, the, of the communists, who have taken sway even of, of the public broadcaster. And they've done this in the open without any huge uh, protests uh, and any reports also on behalf of the, of the international media. And there I have my own, as I said, I have my, from the, if you want to make an accurate observation and a persuasive critiques of particular social state of affairs, you have to be, you have to do your best to be as objective as, as possible. And I think uh, that, is, uh, that, is truly, uh, that is truly lacking. And I could go on and on and on. You know, the first president of the Supreme Court in Slovenia was the last communist president of the Supreme Court. She stayed there until 1993. The former president of the Supreme Court was a political party commissioner from, from Koper, also a member of the, of the Communist Party. The vice president of the, of the Constitutional Court, I mean, this is unprecedented. It, will, it, will, it never happened anywhere else in Central and Eastern Europe. The vice president of the Constitutional Court was Mr. Tsiri Ribicic, who was the last president of the Central Committee of, uh, of, the, Slovenian, of the Slovenian Communists. So, I mean, but this is something which is considered normal in Slovenia. And it is considered normal in Slovenia because the media have portrayed it as normal. And the media have portrayed it as, as normal because these media are traced back to this very same elite and traced back to the source of money that, that, that funds them. And I find it really, it's, it's, it's simply totally unpersuasive and it doesn't live up to any professional integrity to speak when, you, when our colleague Spela has mentioned a number of networks that are reporting for the Slovenian Democratic Party to call this the media empire. This is nonsensical. It covers probably less than 5% of the media spectrum. No one reads that because it's been so discredited. The problem is that you, the, the rest of the empire has been, uh, has been led and governed by the, the forces that I described. And it is impossible to, to put this story through because the media is filtering. It's so unprofessional that certain voices simply cannot be heard. So, some stories do, simply do not, go to, get, uh, do not go through the, 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 the media, uh, um, the, the media uh, large pecha, as it were. So I think there's, and I think there's a major problem for the, uh, for, for the quality of, the, of, of, of democracy. And just one last sentence about the link between the economic monopoly and the political pluralism. 
Uh, my friends from the Faculty of Social Sciences haven't really questioned, and I think they should have. How is it possible that in Slovenia, a couple of weeks before the elections, wholly new political parties are structured? They, they win the elections. Where do they get the money from? How do they get the support in, in, in the media? Because these are, they, they're really created overnight. And apparently for, you know, for, a political, for a political campaign to be so successful, to take, to, to win a landslide, you have to have an economic support from somewhere, right? And I think this is and the, 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 the problem of uh, this kind of single person political parties political party of pensioners, political party of Alenka Bratushek, political party of Miro Tseran. They have no programs. They have no political programs. And the, what they represent is anti Yansha, whatever that means. And I think that's, this, this shows that essentially Slovenian democracy has, has imploded in and of itself, but this is not made critical. These political parties are portrayed by the media as the normal liberal parties. There are none of that because they're not parties at all and they're not liberal because they have no program whatsoever. So I could go on and on and on and, that and tire you out and I, but I won't, don't want to occupy any more time, any more time here. It's a lot of it is, uh, is in the book. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have now a lot of material for Speller to comment on. Uh, what I take is that the, the data question is somehow, um, look at the politicization of important positions in the past, what you say, uh, like people appointed from parties to important posts, which you also see in other countries, and that uh, that ongoing conflict actually shows pluralism. So maybe taking from this for my question that uh, pluralism is increasing with with a level of conflict somehow. Um, so uh, as I said, for Speller, a lot of to stuff to comment on. Um, I would probably connect to the comment I made after your presentation, which would be yeah. how much of the change that happened since last year uh, do you see as, and it's probably still to come under this government, uh, do you see as lasting change? So talking about uh, changes of, of ownership structure of media, of legislation, um, which goes beyond the, this climate uh, that you okay. described. So the, the climate of uh, humiliation and putting pressure on people, um, yeah. what would you say is there to stay? And maybe for the others, as we have only very limited time for a final round, probably you can uh, already look into the questions which were put, some of them addressed uh, directly to, to persons, uh, which you could also take up for, for the final round of answer, answers. But, but Spella, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would first like to um, uh, to answer Mr. Aubel's uh, uh, accusation in in a way that uh, journalists were not protesting over the over these uh, political pressures that are uh, transparent in the program board of our public broadcaster. This is not true. I know that also the, 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 the law that we had before uh, uh, transferred some of these political, uh, political uh, pressures into the, into the program board. This, there, is no, there is no perfect solution to this question, you know? But the and the law that we have now, and I, I I I pointed this out in my presentation that these laws are bad, and these laws are laws that were proposed and adopted by Yanis Yansha's government. And my criticism to all the other uh, political actors and parties is that they did not change the law. Why didn't they change the laws? Because they benefited from them. Of course, they wanted their members in the in the in the uh, uh, program board of our uh, public broadcaster. Of course, they wanted control. Polit po political parties, politicians always want control over the media. This is the fact. So my criticism goes to all the parties, not just Yanis Yansha. It's not just Yanis Yansha's problem, which I pointed out. And uh, regarding the, and I don't really don't agree with that assumption that uh, our uh, media and journalists are not professional. I think we are having ethical counsel. We are, um, we are um, um, 
going through these complaints all the time and we see what the journalists are doing good or wrong and uh, around 50 in 50% 50 of the cases we determined that the code of ethics was not was not breached so it's like 50-50 uh, uh, um, score for or against the breaching of the code. So these are facts. And uh, going for the, I mean, if we look at the at the media that uh, SDS established through the years, we can see, you know, there is full of misinformation. The articles were not signed at all. They were not the the editorial teams, you know, were not made public on their web website. So we were not. We, you could not determine who was the author of of specific articles. The comments under the comment sections are not removed, although they are totally insulting, you know, and breaching their own uh, code of practice regarding the comments. Uh, and there is full of smear campaigns. There was a lot of hatred toward uh, migrants, LGBT, uh, and everybody who is critical over government. So I would not point those media as add to the pluralism in this country. Sorry, I, uh, in, I, I, I have nothing against right-wing media, you know, and political pluralism at all. But this is not pluralism. This is not professional journalism. I'm sorry, this is political propaganda and also misinformation and assaults and smear campaigns and not professional journalism. I have to, to, to say that. Uh, and not to be too long uh, regarding the la long lasting uh, effects. Yes, it's true. The media legislation we still have. It's the, it's the legislation that uh, Yanis Yansha adopted, you know, and now with this year's media tender, for example, where the media outlets were excluded because of their political bias, supposed political bias, you know, this legislation we had for 15 years, you know, and it was bad outcomes of all these uh, different commissions that that were giving that were uh, uh, dividing these subsidiaries we were critical over this system through the through the years but this year you know uh, government or the ministry or the commission which was biased you know at by the the members of the commission were were, were not like uh, unbiased uh, the 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 result was that they just you know followed their own law. They followed what the law um, allowed them to do, you know, and that's the fact. And for 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 now, I have to say that uh, we are uh, seeing you know this climate is of course um, affecting journalists. Of course, they are also leaving the, 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 the occupation, they are leaving journalism, um, or uh, 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 like consequences for a SDA can be like, you know, bankruptcy on the end. Uh, if they won't uh, be successful in the, in the legal battles, which I think they will, because the law is on their side, what the government is doing is unlawful. But, um, you know, the procedures might take too long. So they will, uh, without uh, uh, public financing, it's questionable how long they will, they will last. So these consequences can be long term. Also, we uh, now are um, hearing the reports that there are uh, Mr. Owell was saying, you know, that the the problem of pluralism is uh, deriving from the economical uh, sphere. You know, we can see how. I mean, uh, we know that uh, that, uh, for example, new Czech owner of our biggest commercial television is now uh, monitoring the the reporting of the of the uh, pop tv and canal a and the slovene government is sending them letters all the time and also that janes jansha 
was meeting in secrecy with the with the owner of now deceased owner uh, mr kellner of uh, the new owner of of pop tv so i think you know that these pressures are going on and uh, the more uh, this new elite and also these foreign investments will come to Slovenia, the more they will change the, the uh, economical relations and the more pressure can be exercised. And I want to point out that we are aware of the pressure that even, uh, um, you know, all owners of newspapers are exercising. And for example, Mr. Petrich, you know, he came into the newsroom and he said, I want you to be loyal to me. You know, this is your job. I'm your owner. So there are problems uh, regarding editorial uh, autonomy uh, from all different owners and all, politi all, all political parties or politicians or governments are trying to gain control over the media. Thank you very much, Bella. And um, I think with this, you have already taken up a few points that were uh, already asked by uh, the audience in the Q&A section. And um, I would like to, to take up some of the questions uh, mixed with my own final one to have a, a quick final round, uh, one minute for each of you. And I would like you to focus on the coming decade for Slovenia. How will the next decade look like most likely uh, what do you think, who is likely to create it, uh, who is likely to shape it, and uh, taking into account uh, external influences like uh, people write about Russia or Hungary, uh, Spella has said something now uh, about the Czech Republic, and um, what about uh, more privatization of the economy, will we see something like this, and what about legacies of the past, so will there be uh, more uh, more plural, pluralism in the future uh, as we have more economic pluralism or do you reject this thesis at all that that this is linked somehow as Mate argued it so um, we go for a, a quick final round and uh, starting with Nico and one minute each uh, of our panelists and maybe as a quick adword for those who have to leave sharply now uh, we will have a special issue with all of our panelists published next week as a birthday present for Slovenia's 30th anniversary. So uh, answering the question of whether you can get the slides, you will get the papers uh, of this discussion. Nico, please. Well, um, if we want to assess the next dec decade or 10 years, I mean, obviously long-term economic forecasting is, is smoke and mirrors as the coronavirus situation can attest. Nevertheless, I, I think purely from an economic standpoint, the situation is not dire. Yeah, there are, of, there are, let's say, developments in Slovenia which have a high potential. There's a sort of a, almost like a Mittelstand of, of small and medium-sized companies growing, which are very export-oriented, oriented, have high salaries, high value added per employee. Yeah, there were some comments which alluded to foreign direct investment which in Slovenia has, also, has actually became the third highest among uh, the CEE countries by 2019, so less than Estonia and the Czech Republic, but still, again, not all FDE is, is, is the same from a development standpoint. Um, yeah, and this is the kind of question of uh, what kind of growth program can a country pursue? I would argue this kind of you know, factory-based low-skill low uh, pursuit of jobs is not necessarily one that delivers you to the club of the most uh, prosperous nations. Instead, it's having big companies with research and development uh, uh, departments investing in the green transformations, doing so successfully, building comparative advantages in, in industries which will deliver the most income in the next 10 years. And these are on the green side, on the high tech side, and so on but all of that without losing a high standard of public services, healthcare, education, uh, and all of that. And that is, of course, is the great challenge. And here, um, a lot of work will, will need to be done. Uh, um, yeah, to build Thank a you. kind of new growth model, yeah. Thank you, Nico. Um, Matej, what, what do you think what the future holds and who's going to shape it? Well, I would hope that, uh, you know, to, to 
to create constitutional democracy properly so call, uh, called, it has to be taken as a value in and of itself by a critical mass of people uh, in Slovenia. And I think that is, that is missing. The, the, the awareness that, can we, that we can have these political fights, uh, then we can have these ideological disagreements by, and that this doesn't require that we take over the institutions completely and attack our political opponent as much as possible. I think that is that that kind of political sentiment has to be has to be developed and it's currently missing and with this exacerbated uh, conflict in which we are now sort of bellum omnium contra omnes this toxic environment I agree the environment is completely uh, is completely toxic and we are not getting uh, in the in in the right direction the past matters secret service files were basically all of them destroyed the people never learned about who was actually uh, monitoring them? Who was uh, who was uh, who was behind them? The secret service agents became they they enter private practice. They became lobbyists and are driving behind the scenes. This is the informal infrastructure that that that, that, that drives also uh, the state. So I also I also with this the, the exchange that we had today about me about the media and the quality of media and and uh, all the rest. I think it, we could go on and on and just point out, you know, what Yansha is doing, what the other side is doing and who's doing that and who is doing that. But that makes no sense. I mean, we should be aware that media are not and the journalists are not there for their own sake, but they are there in order to ensure freedom of expression because it is through the media to what to which, what they, the stories that they tell us, it is through that that we create a constitutional democracy. And we have to push up this to the higher higher standards, also in order not to fall prey to other uh, forces. Russia has had, doesn't have inroads under Ryansha. Russian, uh, Russia has, a, has had meaningful support by the, uh, the post-communist by, by post left. Um, so there, th this is not an issue, but you know, there, there's not just Russia, there's China and there are other, uh, there, there, there are other uh, influences out there. So there are major challenges ahead. I would hope that Slovenia sees its, its own future in the heart of Europe among the core member states and that we use the best practices of the European Union in terms of rule of law and democracy to bring them home rather than exporting our fights abroad and bringing them home as showing, listen, everyone is showing how that or another government uh, is actually uh, bad. So I think the next 30 years, it will be a time to mature, but it will be also high time to change the generations. And I have my fingers crossed that that happens and that we, we drift closer to the constitutional democracy rather than backwards from it. Thank you. Alenka, what do you think? Well, I actually think that the polarization is going to continue, polarization in state, polarization in society. Um, and uh, this is not a very good prospect, I think, for Slovenia. Um, I also expect that there will be some new political parties available on the next um, elections. Uh, but of course, it also depends on how many political parties, uh, new political parties, and how successful they will be. This also depends on a question whether center left spectrum will be able to form let's say, this pre-electoral coalition. Um, yeah, um, I mean, Matei uh, actually provoked us um, uh, earlier with the question how uh, successful political parties emerged in Slovenia. I mean, to be successful in elections for the first time, you actually don't need a lot of money. You don't need a lot of finances, simply because all these new political parties after 2008, successful new political parties, uh, have been very personalized. And once you're in parliament, you can simply receive public subsidies. And the public subsidies are the most important uh, financial source for political parties. Um, otherwise, I believe that Slovenia will continue to be still a welfare state, especially if center left block, let's say center left block, will 
be able to form a next governmental coalition. This doesn't mean that uh, the welfare state is going to be uh, in the same status as it is now, at the same level as it, as it is now. But um, I believe that uh, uh, the center left political parties, uh, at least in the sense of a question, at least in these uh, questions related to the welfare state, has a clear support among electorate because it's possible to identify several things which clearly show that people in Slovenia would like to have solidarity and would like to have also functioning welfare state and public services. But I'll stop here, otherwise I can tell uh, many different things. <laughs> so, so also ground to believe that there will be some continuity. Um, Meta, you have the final, the final take on uh, the future. Thank you. Well, I think it was an interesting point you uh, sort of said after our presentation that I think it's extremely important uh, and also concerns the future. That is that recently, in the recent years, we are sort of lacking a common aim or goal that we would reach as a, as a society. So after the independence, sort of everyone was directed towards EU, let's sort of join EU, uh, let's become the first member state to sort of uh, get the euro, hold the presidency, and we were successful at that. And now we kind of are lost in this space, we don't know where to turn further. And I think this has also an influence on, on the citizens, sort of on their dissatisfaction, on their distrust to the political institution, maybe also some kind of pessimism and apathy. Um, and uh, I think that also because we are all aware of that, this status quo that we are in it now, although it might be still sort of favorable and good, uh, is uh, sort of, um, um, facing a lot of challenges, and these are namely aging, aging society, uh, the problem with uh, with the health system, with the pension system, with the environment, uh, and these are the questions that no one addresses. And I think that especially the young generation, also in Slovenia, not just in other European countries, are more interested in these questions than the past and what has passed, what happened in the past. Uh, so I hope that, I, I'm not sure this will happen in the near future, but in uh, any case, I hope that in the future, we will start addressing rider these questions. Thank you very much. And um, I would just like briefly to thank uh, our panel for this very interesting and very inspiring discussion today. Uh, I would like to point everybody again to the publication we're going to launch next week by all of our panelists on the issues we discussed today. It will be in our online journal, Southeast Europe in Focus, so freely available online, and you will receive an, an email notification in our newsletter when it will be published. Um, I think I've learned a lot about Slovenia today, and also uh, that being a front runner is, is a good thing, but doesn't really keep you from having any problems at all. Uh, but that the, the questions of the future are always difficult ones and that you, um, that you might, might face instability even if your country looks, looks very stable for many, many kind of indicators. So uh, I thank you very much for bearing with us uh, for all of this time and look forward to welcoming you to the next event. Hopefully next week our journalism award on Monday uh, would be great to have you again on this. So see you, uh, see you next week and to all the Slovenes have a nice celebration of 30 years of independence next week. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>